Hello everyone, welcome. I'm going to continue with this uh, retreat book. I know that um, it won't have a lot of uh, audience, a uh, huge audience uh, by any means, but I think it's important because everyone is talking about everything else, politics, and I think part of uh, perhaps the problems that we have certainly in the West come from a in many cases, a lack of spiritual focus or spiritual understanding. And uh, the uh, the book that I started yesterday, uh, I'll just remind um, I'll just remind you, is um, a book based on um, a compilation of talks given to Catholic nuns, to um, Carmelite nuns. Uh, the Carmelites were, the Reformed Carmelites, uh, as you know, were founded by St. Teresa of Avila, hence all the um, quotes and references that he makes uh, to St. Teresa, because it was the foundress of their order. And the talks um, are based on a pilgrimage that uh, Father Bertrand, uh, uh, Jerome Bertrand uh, did to Santiago, to Compostela, the, the, the famous Camino. And he is um, talking a little bit about what was happening as they were walking. And it seems as if it was a nightmare of a walk, especially from uh, crossing France, from Spain, all the, because it was raining all the time, and at times torrential rain, rain, and at other times it seems that it was that trickling rain that you don't notice so much, but it soaks you to the to the to the bone, and uh, it just it's very apparent that actually the the walk itself was a little bit of a nightmare, so he's drawing on what was happening at any one time during the, the walk, during the journey, the pilgrimage, and then reflects on the spiritual life and so on, and takes lessons from that. And that is what uh, he's trying to explain. Remember at all times that he is addressing in this retreat, spiritual exercises, he is actually talking to nuns of, uh, you know, the Carmelite order. But in any case, perhaps um, we can draw one or two lessons from that. Um, I'm just saying. Okay, so um, the birth of joy. We found it was very pleasant going on pilgrimage once we had made a start. The sun shone but was not too hot. We found friendly people on the way, and the food and wine were excellent. We began in Paris by visiting the church of Saint Jacques de Aupin, which is where the pilgrimages traditionally started in the Middle Ages. The curé gave us a good welcome, and we concelebrated mass with a great send-off from the good parishioners. So we wandered on our way down through France. Sometimes we stayed in, a, in friendly convents, sometimes we camped out in nice dry woods. The route lay along pleasant little country lanes meandering between the farms. At other times we were on footpaths miles from any habitation. We lay on grassy banks by cool streams for lunch, watching great birds of prey hovering overhead, and we approached the Pyrenees, as we approached the Pyrenees. In the small towns and villages, we found marvelous restaurants where we ate extremely well for very little money. In every village were quaint little churches, especially in the Basque country, where in the, in the French portion of the Basque Country, where every church had a pelota court attached to it. Pelota, which means ball, uh, is an obscure Basque ritual which seems to occupy the place of cricket uh, in their national spirituality. The Basque people were very friendly and spoke French to us out of 
likeness wearing their little berets. So, all in all, we found that going on pilgrimage was really pleasant indeed. It fulfilled our expectations of wandering gently in the cool of the morning and the cool of the evening, while in the heat of the day we could sit under a tree by the side of a river and have our lunch, watching the birds and little white fluffy clouds moving across the sky. When we start our pilgrimage, and this is the spiritual lessons that he's going to draw from it now, when we start our pilgrimage, it's always like that, isn't it? The path of faith, the path of prayer, always seem to begin so very pleasantly. The fervor of the new convert or the youngest novice is proverbial. It is always a great joy to begin the Christian path and we do find it very pleasant as soon as we've made our acceptance and said, be it done unto me according to thy will. It don't seem to be any problems in following God's will at the beginning. In fact, we wonder why it is that some of the older members of the community, some of the more established Christians seem to have lost that forever. We may even be rather scornful of them because we know that we have received the joy of God's grace and feel that they should be just as joyful. New converts find it a great joy to come to church. In fact, it's difficult to get them out when you want to lock up. <laughs> New novices act in the same way. For them, it is always a great joy to praise the Lord. There is a real joy in everything, particularly any form of prayer, because prayer is made easy for us. The Mass becomes the source of our joy and the source of our pleasure, and we find that it doesn't matter to us if it is in Latin or English, or whether it is good music or bad music, new, mu new music or old. We're not really bothered at this stage about the externals of the liturgy because the Mass itself, the joy of the great sacrifice, speaks to us. We find that Christ is born in our hearts in Holy Communion. For the convert, the one, the one nearly, newly started on the way of the cross, there is a real feeling of pleasure in receiving our Lord in Holy, Holy Communion. We wonder why following Jesus is called the way of the cross, since for us it seems to be a way of gentleness and peace, a way lined with flowers, a very gentle way in which our Lord leads us by the hand. If Mass is a joy, so too is the office, as we gladly join our brothers and sisters singing the praises of the Lord. We feel that the office could go on forever. No matter how long the psalms are, the great rhythm of the music carries us on. We feel an exaltation inside us as the Lord allows the Holy Spirit to speak in our hearts, to give us that praise of the Father. Every time we recite the psalms, we find another jewel in the text, another verse, another few words that really mean something. They can stay with us all day. We go through our daily life, even doing the most ordinary things of life, almost skipping for joy as we remember a phrase that we picked up in the Psalms, some word that's fallen from the scriptures, some word of the Mass. Even private prayer, even mental prayer seems to be so very easy at first. When we begin to pray, it is no effort just to put ourselves in the presence of the Lord and to be quiet before him. Concentration is never a difficulty. We can sit or kneel there, gazing, spellbound at the Blessed Sacrament. Prayer comes naturally to us now. There is no need to think of words. The last thing we want to do is to look and see how the time is passing. It's a disappointment when the bell strikes and we have to go and do something else. Then it's so easy to remember our friends at prayer, to place them before the Lord, so easy to remember all those who ask our prayers. 
gently to mention them, to dwell on them lovingly in the presence of the Lord. Somehow prayer, the Mass, liturgy, the office, everything seems delightful. The danger is lest we become very critical indeed of those crabbed old members of the community who don't seem to enjoy it so much. Them we find impossible to understand. In the same way, the duties of the Christian life seem so very simple. It's a real joy to do good, to perform little acts of charity. You will remember how St. Teresa describes her own novitiate. It was a joy to her to do some little thing for an oldest sister, for an old sister, and she found it difficult to get to sleep at night if she couldn't remember having done something helpful. What a relief if, just as she was preparing for bed, she heard one of the older sisters stumbling up the steps. Teresa was able to rush out and help her up, up to her room. There is a real joy in serving other people, and for the Christian in the world who is just beginning the life of grace, there is true joy in doing practical works of mercy. It is the new converts who always join the society of St. Vincent de Paul who are absolutely delighted when they get a chance to go out into the council estate or the uh, poorer areas of uh, town or to the tower blocks to find a poor family. They really feel a pleasure. It is characteristics characteristic that they find the pleasure in anticipation, enjoying the prospect of going to Mass, beginning to pray, visiting the poor, even attending parish meetings. This pleasure of anticipation is followed by pleasure while we are actually working or praying, and again afterwards we feel happy to have done God's will. This glorious period of fervour is a very genuine and very real gift from the Lord because what our Lord is doing for the new convert is allowing Christ to be born in their soul so that they are filled with the reality of Christian life. Of course, it is our own imagination that tells us I am now a perfect Christian, a perfect, a perfect novice, a perfect deacon, a perfect priest, or whatever. There is nothing more to live for. That is always the danger with the new convert. We think we've got there. There is no further to go. Here I am. Christ has now been born in my heart. I am filled with grace. And it is genuinely grace. We recognize it as such. There need not be an element of pride. We can accept and be grateful for this gift of prayer, this gift of the love of God, this gift of love for other people, the fact that it's so easy to cope with difficult people. We find that we are able to smile benignly on the most repulsive people. All these graces we humbly recognize to be gifts from God, and there is no reason not to revel in this great welling of joy, which is the first fruits of grace in our hearts. The danger is, of course, to think that is as far as it goes. It does indeed happen that new converts fall into the trap, the terrible trap of spiritual pride. They fondly imagine that there is nothing more to live for. They are certainly going to heaven. Everything is sorted out in life. And they are so terribly liable to despise the rest of humanity, especially those who call themselves Christians but really don't seem to have that Christian joy. Particularly among young people, among students, you find that when God's grace is first born in their hearts, they can be very critical indeed of old established Christians, even going to the extreme of wondering whether we are really Christians at all if we don't display that visible, tangible joy all the time. 
that is obviously a peril and one to be always on the watch for, since spiritual pride can arise in various disguises and various pious concealments. Yet there is no need to fall into this trap and with common decency and humility a fervent new convert or a new novice can unashamedly enjoy and really make the most of that birth of Christ in their souls. So it was with Our Lady, she travelled from Nazareth to Bethlehem, knowing that she had the friendship, the support and the love of Elizabeth and her family, and of Saint Joseph, to say nothing of Saints Joachim and Anna, who seemed to have been left behind in Nazareth. She comes to Bethlehem and Christ is born, and in that moment of the birth of our Lord, Our Lady must have felt there was nothing left to do. Here is Christ born, the whole of the Old Testament has come to its fulfillment. There is nothing more to live for, all is accomplished, since God and man have been made one. Those first few days were glorious, when Our Lady saw the hope of all the ages placed in her bosom. She saw the joy of the angels, the glory of all the saints made flesh in her stable, in her swaddling clothes. She saw the awe with which the shepherds knelt, the joyful awe. They came in love, they came in excitement, and then the strange pacing of the Maggie, those proud men brought from afar, brought humble before a child in a stable. The glory of the angels. Surely if the shepherds saw the angels, Our Lady cannot have been far behind. Mary's heart was filled with the glory of the birth of Christ. How could she imagine that there was anything else left to do? Those few days in Bethlehem, how could she think there was anything more? The path of being the mother of God surely seemed to be one of an adulterated joy. Maybe she did look ahead, or maybe she saw nothing of what was coming, but for those few days at any rate she could hardly have thought of the future. All her thoughts must have been filled with the joy of knowing that Christ has been born. Christ was truly born, it was no illusion. This joy at the beginning of our Christian life is perfectly genuine. It is a real grace, a real joy and a real birth of Christ in our souls. But of course, as Our Lady was all too soon to see, there can still be a sword of sorrow, still a long way to go. The path to glory leads ever past the cross. That is why so often in our paintings of the crib you see the infant Jesus stretching out his arms in the form of the cross as if to show us that yes, this joy, this glory is perfectly real but there is more to come. Fitting in once we were on our way, it did not take us long to realize, well, we had guessed it before, actually, that when you are visiting a strange country, however near, you have to conform to their way of doing things. Their laws, their customs are very different from ours, and the traveler must at least try to fit in. For walkers, the first obvious difference is that the French will drive on the wrong side of the road. And so, to face the traffic, we have to walk on what for us would be the wrong side of the road too. It was surprisingly difficult to remember that. Among other things, we had to fit in with uh, which, with what were the curious hours at which their shops opened. We had to remember to buy our provisions and whatever we needed on the way at the right moment. Then, once in the shop, 
they had their own ways of running things. It appeared to be essential in the small villages to produce an empty wine bottle to hand in before they would let us have a full one. We had to remember that there were certain times during the day when you can get a meal and certain times when you can't. For instance, in small villages in France, we found it easy to get lunch, but supper seems to be quite unheard of. <laughs> we settled eventually into a routine of a picnic breakfast and supper, and then lunch in a little cafe. In Spain, on the other hand, they did serve meals in the evening, but Everything in Spain happened so much later that lunch was not served before two in the afternoon and dinner not much before ten. All the way along we had to adjust to the people we walked among, to speak their language, to do things their way, fit into their customs. We were guests in a foreign country trying as far as possible to accommodate ourselves to their way of life. Now, if we are on a pilgrimage of grace, a pilgrimage uh, towards the heavenly city, we are also, in a sense, pilgrims in a foreign land, though it is a land that will eventually become our homeland. This is not our real homeland. As St. Paul tells us, our homeland is in heaven. We have to adjust to the customs, fit into the way of life of our heavenly homeland. Their customs are very different to ours. We've been used to living according to the laws and customs of this world, and there is an enormous amount of change to be made, an enormous amount of adjustment to our daily habits to our whole way of life, if we are going to walk on the pilgrimage with Christ. Simply becoming a Christian, having been born not one, makes an enormous difference. Taking on the religious life brings a great difference again. There are new rules to be kept, new laws to observe, new standards to aim at. An outsider looking at us on pilgrimage would wonder how on earth we can remember all these laws. How can we possibly keep track of all the things we have to do and all the things we have to avoid? To the outsider it, might, it must seem as if the Christian life is a continual business of referring to the rule book. We can never do anything without flipping through the Old Testament, counting up the Ten Commandments and seeing which of them we are breaking at the moment. But of course it isn't really like that at all. If Christ has been born in us, if we have started on our pilgrimage, if we have received the grace and the joy and the life of Christ living in us, all these rules and regulations somehow become so much simpler. That again is something very characteristic of the first fervor of conversion, the first fervor of religious life. To keep the moral law of God or the rules of the order seems to be so very, very easy. We wonder again why older members find them so difficult. To begin with, it is no longer a problem to remember what the rules are. We know instinctively what we ought to do. The reason for that is that our conscience becomes more and more reliable as we give ourselves to Christ, as we allow the new life, the Holy Spirit, to dwell in us. It's the Holy Spirit speaking inside us that is our conscience, and the more we allow the Spirit to work, the clearer he can speak. The new Christian therefore no longer has to think and puzzle to search through the Old Testament, look up the Ten Commandments and the Catechism to find out whether something is a sin or not. You know instinctively that it is. We have an even sharper instinct for what is right. Jesus himself said in the Gospel, 
why not judge for yourselves what is right? And once we've begun on our pilgrimage, we are able to judge for ourselves. We do find that God's laws make sense. They are not arbitrary obstacles put in our way to make Christian life more difficult. No, God's laws are there to make life easier. And we discover, if we are beginning to be in love with Christ, that doing his will becomes much more desirable. In the, in the same way, in the first fervor of religious life, doing the work, saying the office, living according to the rule, all becomes so very enjoyable. We cannot understand how anyone could want to be a religious without attempting to keep every detail of the rule. Of course, there is a big difference between acknowledging the law and being able to keep it. I think the ability to keep God's law is something that comes in stages, but it does begin in the first fervor of Christian life, as we feel the joy of prayer, the joy of the Mass, the joy of the sacraments. You find that it becomes easier and easier to keep the moral law, to keep the rule of the order. People commonly follow a pattern of development as they strive to come closer to Christ. To begin with, many have for years been struggling against the habit of sin. Perhaps at first they don't really believe it is, it is a sin, not in their heart of, the heart of hearts. But they confess it because the catechism says they should. Then they come to the stage of realizing that it is indeed the will of God that they should overcome this habit. It really is something dragging them away from Christ. And then as they grow in the life of prayer, suddenly, unexpectedly, it becomes possible. I have met so many people who tell me that for years they never believed they could possibly overcome their particular besetting sin. They were quite resigned that this was going to be with them forever, and they almost automatically, whenever they went to confession, used the same words, as if they had despaired of the work of grace. And then at last God speaks, and then the problem disappears, sometimes so suddenly and completely that they can never quite believe it had ever happened. Once you start on pilgrimage, once you start setting aside time every day for prayer, you will find prayer is easy and joyful. If you have established the habit of good works, they too become something you are eager to do. Now it is a real pleasure to give to the poor. Again, in the first fervor of conversion, so many people find fasting delightful. With a regular routine of self-denial, suddenly the old habits of sin somehow disappear. People say to me sometimes, but it was so easy, Father, why couldn't I do it before? And the answer, of course, is, you didn't do it. It was the grace of God working in you. God does make it possible for us to keep his laws. He does make it possible for us to keep the rules of our order or even to be obedient to a superior, for us clergy to give our bishop the obedience and respect we promised him at our ordination, and which we commonly find so very difficult. Christian sanctity does become possible. This joy of Christ is born in our lives because he comes to lead us gently on our pilgrimage. Without him, we really would wander astray. Without his guidance, it would be so easy to wander off our path, to turn aside into marshes and desert places, or to give up altogether. With him, there come to guide us, uh, pointing out the way, it becomes a well-marked pilgrimage route. At every step of the way, there is a signpost, but we find we don't even need to look at them because our path is obvious as we instinctively follow our conscience. 
we find it's possible to see what is good and to do it, to know what is bad and avoid it. That is why in the first fervor of conversion, so many people speak of old habits of sin overcome, old problems long forgotten. As I said, the danger is that people become very intolerant of those who don't seem to have overcome their problems yet. It can be very difficult for the newly fervent, the newly converted, to understand why some of the older members seem to have so much difficulty in keeping the rules, so much more trouble with the elementary commandments. It can be hard to be tolerant of them, and the fervor of the new convert often has to be moderated with a degree of understanding and compassion. Yet again, that is sickening easy for some of them. Once you point out that we are commanded to forgive others as we hope to be forgiven, you find the new convert eagerly going around forgiving everyone in sight. The joy of being able to follow God's law and the tremendous sense of liberation and peace which it brings is a gift is a gift which Christ surely does give to us. It's a perfectly genuine gift, and again, as in the case of the gift of joy, the temptation is to think there is nothing more to live for in Christian life. I've reached perfection, I will never sin again, I must be already at the goal of my pilgrimage. Perhaps that is why our Lord always reminds us very gently that there are still problems to come. It may well be that having overcome one besetting sin, you suddenly discover there was something else much worse which we never even noticed. Although our friends may have been quite aware of it all the time, it may be that some wise director or some word in scripture points out the next stage, gives us a friendly warning, but we should savor this moment of joy, this time of grace, for it is genuine, a gift from God. It is time we must use well to prepare for the difficulties which are still to come. So it was with Our Lady. She took Jesus to the temple to be presented according to the law of Moses, that every firstborn should be offered to God, and a sacrifice should be given in celebration of this gift of a child, and also that the mother should be purified so that after the great holiness of childbirth she could be able to return to ordinary everyday life. So they fulfilled the commandments, not just the commandments of the law, but even the little rules made up by the scribes and the Pharisees. We are reminded many times in the Gospels that there is a difference between the law which God revealed to Moses and the tradition of the elders, which were wrapped around the law like a hedge in order to protect it. Our Lady and Saint Joseph didn't quibble and didn't and they didn't distinguish. They observed the law and they respected the tradition of the elders and they carried out precisely and meticulously what was expected of them. They brought two young pigeons and they said the necessary prayers. They made the necessary offering in the temple. They offered the sacrifice for the redemption of the one who is himself the Redeemer, for the purification of her who was the most pure. Did Saint Joseph and Our Lady fully grasp the true significance of who this child was? Surely they could not so soon have understood it all. But at least they must have known that to redeem the Redeemer was a work that was in the strictest sense unnecessary. They must have known that there was no need for purification, there was no need for the presentation, and yet they did it to fit in with the law of God's people, to be obedient in all things to the law. 
the Pharisees and scribes reading through the Old Testament found 613 separate commandments. 613 separate commandments, of which 248 were positive requirements and 365 were prohibitions. All had to be obeyed. These formed the Torah and around them are the innumerable precepts of the Mishnah and the Talmud, a very complicated and very difficult system of law to observe. Has there ever been a Jewish family who managed to keep it all except the Holy Family? In Our Lady's kitchen everything was prepared precisely according to the Jewish law. I'm sure she never boiled milk in a meat, meat saucepan. So it was in their house and in their dress. So, what, so it was in their house and in their dress. When Our Lady made a seamless, gar, seamless garment for our Lord, he might have had tassels in precisely the right places or just the right length as laid down in the tradition of the elders. Everything was done to fit in with the laws of God's people even though Our Lady was well aware that those traditions were passing away, even though she knew that her son was the one who made that law. He it was for the sake of whom all those laws had been made. The whole ritual of purification in the temple was only instituted for the sake of the one who was to come to the temple and purify it, for the sake of Jesus himself. But they observed the law, they submitted to it, giving a model of obedience and humility. There are so many people we meet who imagine themselves above the law. They consider that they have reached the highest state of perfection than the mere mortals around them. Our Lady really was superior to the law, she really had reached the highest state of perfection, but she never for a moment thought that she could disobey the law. She remained faithful and lived according to it. So too did our Lord. He observed the Jewish law right through his life. He himself said this observance was a burden too heavy to be borne, that no one could obey it except through grace. And it was only through grace that Our Lady was able to obey the whole of the law. And that grace gave her great joy. There is no reason to assume that she found it in the slightest bit difficult or inconvenient to obey the law. She obeyed the law because it was the law of God, the law of God's people, and God was the great lover of her soul. She found a great joy in observing the law of presentation, in coming to the temple and carrying out the ritual. And at that very moment of her joy, Simon appears at her side and says, A sword of sorrow shall pierce your own soul too. It is with that warning that Our Lady remembers or perhaps she realizes for the first time that there is a great deal more to be done. This joy is a sound and firm foundation for her life, but there is more to come. So she listens to Simon, she remembers his warning, and she ponders all these things in her heart. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.